dive into this morning's text, I wanted to make a brief announcement about our upcoming missions fair, which is this Sunday morning, immediately following the 11 o'clock service. I'd like to invite all of you to plan to come if you can. I think it's it will be very uh, it will be very much worth your time. A lot of planning has gone into this missions fair, and you're going to receive information. And I hope also some inspiration about what God is doing through Field Street Baptist Church, really uh, globally. You're going to have the opportunity to learn about uh, what God is doing uh, through our missions efforts in places like Cambodia, uh, Mission Waco, uh, our construction team that goes anywhere they are invited to help uh, construct and repair uh, physical facilities. You're going to learn about Poland, New Orleans, our backyard Bible club ministry in Cleburne. Uh, you'll learn about the, our ministry in part is Children's Home where we are uh, partnering to do ministry in the Dominican Republic. And then you'll learn about a ministry we have in, in the Philippines. It's going to be a, a great opportunity for you to come and learn uh, about what God is doing through Field Street and in Field Street to make His name known among the nations. It's just really remarkable how God has brought together and orchestrated in and through Field Street the opportunity to touch uh, a variety of places in the Lord's uh, Kingdom Vineyard. So we want to invite you to come and be a part of this immediately following the 11 o'clock service uh, Sunday. We are serving a light lunch and hopefully we'll have enough food. <laughs> so if we don't, HEB is right down the street. We'll, we'll scramble and make sure everyone's uh, fed adequately, but then you will uh, receive information on how you can uh, efforts, uh, how you can give if you can't go. Uh, you can still support by giving uh, financially, and then you'll learn about how uh, you may go and the opportunities that are presented. I think it'll be well, well worth your time uh, Sunday morning if you'd like to come out and be a part of that right after the 11 o'clock service. Brian, do you want to add anything to that? You're kind of the ringleader on that, so uh, we thank you for putting all that together. Well, open your Bibles to 1 Timothy. We are in the final chapter of 1 Timothy, chapter 6. And in these verses this morning, verses 1 and 2, uh, basically it's a setup Paul establishes for addressing some affinity groups in the church. So he's going to give instruction to Timothy about some of the varying groups of believers that you find in uh, the congregation. He's going to address the group that would be identified as Christian slaves in verses 1 and 2. In verses 3 through 10, he'll address again false teachers. In verses 11 through 16, uh, he'll talk about the pastor himself. And then in verses 17 through 19, he will address uh, the wealthy. So there's a lot packed in uh, chapter 6. Let's bow in prayer. Thank you for being here this morning. Lord, as we study this passage today, would you please, by your Spirit, uh, guide us to have a, a greater understanding of this portion of your Word. Thank you for the time we've had uh, over the last uh, number of weeks to work and walk through this wonderful book in the Bible uh, thank you for its instruction about the life of the church, those who lead and serve. We pray, Father, that you'll be with us um, this morning as we study. And then as we depart uh, here in just a little bit, as we move into the day, we ask for your guidance and your blessing. Uh, we pray, Father, for our nation, especially we pray for our president, for the vice president, for the Congress. Uh, Lord, we pray for our courts, for our military men and women, first responders. We thank you for so many that uh, serve the public. We please watch over them. We especially ask your guidance upon our government in these days so that we, as your people, may live quiet and godly lives, uh, being about your bidding and business, uh, the work of the kingdom. We pray for this missions fair that we're hosting on uh, Sunday. I pray there will be a great and high level of interest across our church. Uh, this will be a very informative and inspirational time as we uh, learn and celebrate what you're doing uh, in and through this church to make Christ known literally among the nations. Uh, we pray for 
those in Indonesia who've been overwhelmed by this uh, recent tsunami and the death count is remarkable. We just pray for those who are responding and trying to make heads or tails of what to do next and uh, the devastation uh, to that land. Father, please uh, work in the hearts and lives of those uh, who have survived and now have been displaced from their homes. They're talking well over 60,000 plus who have no home to go back to. I, I, I can't imagine. Please, God, as only you can, comfort and watch over them. We're so fortunate and we often forget how blessed we are. So remind us uh, as this day unfolds of your presence and goodness in our lives and to be mindful to pray for others who have it far more difficult than we do today. Bless our study. We pray. I dive in headlong into verses 1 and 2 of 1 Timothy 6. After we complete our study of 1 Timothy uh, in a couple of weeks, I'd like for us to do a study on some of the great figures in church history. And I want us to take a, a deep dive look into the lives of men like John Calvin, Martin Luther, William Tyndale, uh, Jonathan Edwards, George Whitfield, and John Knox. If you've never been exposed to these great men, you'll want to make certain you're here for the, these studies because you'll be exposed to some men of God that are truly inspirational. And uh, we'll look at their lives uh, for quite a while. I mean, that's what six figures I've identified that I'd like to take a look at. Probably could take a couple of weeks at least to look at each one. It'll be well worth your time. Uh, these, these men, as I've read about their lives, um, been exposed uh, to their lives, their example, their commitment to Christ and His Word. It really is uh, exceptional to read about and be truly uh, inspirational for all of us. So, just a program note uh, for you to conclude our study through 1 Timothy. Well, we are in verses 1 and 2 of 1 Timothy chapter 6. And these two verses state, Paul writes here, All who are under the yoke of slavery should consider their masters worthy of full respect, so that God's name and our teaching may not be slandered. Those who have believing masters are not to show less respect for them because they are brothers. Instead, they are to serve them even better, because those who benefit from their service are believers and dear to them. These are the things you are to teach and urge on them. In these verses, in a very uh, implied sense in particular, there is some clear teaching on uh, what the Bible sets forth about one's work ethic. Uh, Christians, by virtue of the example we have in Christ and the teaching we find in Scripture, should be some of the hardest working people on the planet. Because we are told in Scripture that everything we do, we are to do as for the Lord. And so right away then the Bible advocates for us as believers to have a solid work ethic. There's nothing in Scripture that, that advocates laziness. And regardless of whether your boss is a good boss or a lousy boss, that should not impact the quality of your work and how hard you work. I've had good bosses and I've had bosses I was glad to walk away from. Um, and you learn from both. But what is constant and consistent for the Christian, for the believer, is that irregardless of who it is you work for, an unbeliever or a believer, you, you still nose to the grindstone. You, you put in an honest day's uh, effort and you work hard as if you are working for the Lord. So the Bible has a lot to say about our work ethic. Evidently, according to what I read in um, the MacArthur New Testament commentary regarding this text, and I've put that information in your introduction on your notes, uh, he, uh, he argues that the Ephesian believers may have been struggling to maintain a biblical work ethic in, in the world of slaves. And clearly, there are some estimates among Bible scholars that more than half of the population of the Roman Empire was composed of slaves. And so uh, Paul 
is instructing Timothy to instruct the slaves that would have been a part of the congregational life that irregardless of whether you work for a master who's a believer or an unbeliever, you have a responsibility to have a solid work ethic. And so we have these verses then uh, from Paul on this subject. Essentially, the first century slaves, according to MacArthur, resembled the indentured servants of the American colonial period. In many cases, slaves were better off than day laborers since much of their food, clothing, and shelter was provided in the time period in which Paul is addressing Timothy regarding this subject matter. So the system of slavery then served as the economic structure and driver in the Roman world and the master-slave relationship closely paralleled the 20th century employer-employee relationship according to uh, MacArthur's commentary on this text. So let's break it down then, uh, verse 1 and verse 2. First of all, in verse 1, Paul talks about slaves. And by the way, uh, he's speaking here in verse 1 of slaves who have a relationship with unbelieving masters. Uh, bond servants are those who are in submission to others. And in the context that we're considering this morning, it's not a negative connotation here. There was nothing negative in this context regarding being called a, a bond servant. Uh, bond servants are those who are in submission to others. This is not a negative connotation and is in fact positive when used in connection with Lord, that is Christ, serving His Father, believers serving God, uh, believers serving the Lord, and then even believers serving non-Christians. We are all servants. We all serve someone. <laughs> And if you're a Christian, you are a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. What a privilege. So there's nothing demeaning in this text about being a bond servant. We are under submission to the Lord Jesus Christ. Who better to be under submission to uh, than Jesus Christ? Jesus himself said that he did not come to be served, but rather to serve. And set for us an example of servitude one to another, and of course the perfect obedience that uh, Christ exhibited to the will of the Father. So bond servants then are those who are in submission to others, and all of us are in submission to one another. This uh, phrase, expression, under the yoke, describes submissive service under another's authority. This is not necessarily describing an abusive relationship. Uh, under the yoke, again, is an expression describing submissive service under another's authority. So, all of us come under the authority of someone who may be over us. That's not a bad thing. That's not a bad dynamic. Uh, when I was in high school, I worked at an appliance store, and my boss was a kind of a, he was a funny guy, but he was, he was moody and temperamental. You never knew which boss was going to show up that day. Some days he'd show up, and he'd be a lot of fun and a joy to work with, and other days he'd be in a bad mood, and, and you, you just wanted to scurry away from him, but you never knew which boss was going to show up. Nonetheless, I was still under his authority, regardless of his temperament or his mood. And so if he said, you need to do this today, then that's what you did. Uh, you need to sweep and mop the floors, then you go and sweep and mop the floors. You need to clean the toilets, then you clean the toilets. Why? Because you are in submission to his authority. And even if he's just a temperamental boss, or a really great boss to work for, really easy going and... and very easy to get along with. Nonetheless, you're still under the authority of that boss. So, under the yoke is an expression describing submissive service under another's authority. The word master here refers to one with absolute and unrestricted authority. 
The word master refers to one with absolute and unrestricted authority. Now, of course, as Christian bosses, as Christian masters, there is no uh, teaching in Scripture that permits or allows us to be abusive of those who are under our authority. Uh, it's not appropriate for a Christian boss uh, to be uh, ridiculous and abusive in their authority and, and their power over uh, the employee or in this case the one under the yoke of that authority. So uh, while you may have absolute and unrestricted authority like they did, like masters did in the time of uh, Paul and Timothy as the context is here, that is not permission to be a tyrant in your relationship with those who are under your authority. As Christians, we are to serve honorably, which means diligent and faithful labor for one's employer. Uh, we have a responsibility as Christian employees to put in an honest day to work hard. Uh, keep our nose to the grindstone, to put in an honest day. I want to work hard for my Lord, and I want to work hard for my church. Uh, I think there's an expectation across the congregation that the pastor and the staff are putting in honest effort and an honest days, uh, to earn an honest day's wage, to work hard. And we work hard as unto and for the Lord. And also we work hard for the people we serve. And so I think this is a reasonable and, and, and biblical expectation that we serve honorably, which means to be diligent and faithful in our labor for our employer. Now, how a believer acts under the authority, according to Paul, actually affects how people view the gospel message that Christians proclaim. In other words, Paul says that the way we behave while on the job, how we carry out our work, our work ethic, actually says volumes about the gospel. That is what he is, he is actually setting forth here in verse 1. All who are under the yoke of slavery should consider their masters worthy of full respect. So that God's name and our teaching, that is a reference to the gospel, so that God's name and our teaching may not be slandered. So it reflects on our Lord and our belief about the very gospel of Jesus Christ by how we carry out our work. And so you can imagine how <laughs> laziness, what laziness would say about what we think about Christ and the gospel whether we intend for it to or not. So the admonition then is, regardless of what kind of master you have, work hard, be diligent, be faithful. When our kids were little bitty, <laughs> we, we would ask them to set the table. You know, they could barely lift the plate up on the table, but our mantra at our home was, you don't work, you don't eat. <laughs> so, of course, we're going to feed our kids. You know, we want people reporting us to CPS. But the, the idea was to instill in them at an early age the value and actually the joy of work. So I, I like to work. Obviously you guys do too. Uh, looking around the room, hard workers in here. So working hard, being faithful and diligent in the work to which we are called is actually a way of, in a sense, declaring our value that we have in the gospel and certainly uh, in in the Lord's name. All who are under the yoke of slavery should consider their masters worthy of full respect so that God's name and our teaching may not be slandered. So how a believer acts then while under the authority of another affects how people view the gospel message Christians proclaim. Thus a Christian's work ethic should include a proper attitude of submission and respect 
performing quality work. In other words, Paul would say, helps make the gospel message believable. So again, we get back to this, what we have stumbled upon several times in our study of 1 Timothy, that, that our beliefs inform our behavior. So if you take seriously what Paul is setting forth in the first two verses of chapter 6 regarding the Christian's work ethic, regardless of whether he has a, a, a master or a, a boss in our context that's a believer or a boss that's an unbeliever, it shouldn't change how you go about your work because of your beliefs. And then your beliefs inform your behavior. That's really true in, in many, if not all, areas of life that well, your fundamental conviction about various ideas and, and, and thoughts and worldview inform your conduct. And it's true on the job as well. So Paul is speaking here of bond servants or slaves in verse 1. Then he looks to verse 2, speaking of slaves that have a believing uh, master. Look at verse 2. It says, those who have, a, have believing masters are not to show less respect for them because they are brothers. Instead, they are to serve them even better because those who benefit from their service are believers and dear to them. These are the things you are to teach and urge on them. So in a sense, if you have the privilege to work for a believing boss, you should serve him even better because he's a brother. <laughs> and of course, this pleases the Lord. This benefits uh, the service. Their service uh, because of the believing relationship, the believing common denominator. And they are dear to you. So working for a Christian should produce even more loyal and diligent service out of love for the brethren. So there is a sense in which you're, you've had the privilege to work for a Christian boss that you, 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 you apply yourself even more so in loyalty and diligent service because of your love for that Christian brother. And then Paul says, these are the things you are to teach and urge on them. Because this relationship dynamic was so prevalent throughout the Roman Empire, it was important for Paul to establish with Timothy, this is what you need to teach in your congregation because you have a large population of uh, slaves, those who are bond servants, who are under the yoke of authority, of another's authority, teach this to them. So irregardless, we are to have a biblically oriented, biblically motivated work ethic. So teach and preach these principles. Furthermore, we should pray for our, our Christian and our non-Christian employers. Uh, looking back on it, I guess in hindsight, I'm actually grateful for some of the crazy bosses I had along the way. <laughs> Boy, did I learn a lot. And, and even some of the bosses that were seemed to me to be uh, unreasonable in their demands <laughs> uh, still taught me something. So I'm, I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for those uh, men, particularly my uncle, who taught me the value uh, uh, of hard work. And... You, you do what has to be done to get the job done. When I was a, a junior in high school, I worked at the local grocery store. For a job because we only had like one, maybe two grocery stores. So a lot of the girls came in, you know, to buy their junk. And so you got a lot of exposure to all the high school girls there, which was a good thing when you're in high school. And then after I'd get off work at the grocery store, I'd drive out to my uncle's farm and I would uh, drive his tractor, called it moonlighting. He'd drive tractor under the moonlight and I'd plow up his fields so that he could go home and get some rest. And I'd just plow from like midnight till five in the morning. Man, you're talking about just tired all the time. How can a junior in high school be tired all the time? That was one reason why. 
But he, you know, if I didn't do it right, he was pretty quick to make me do it over. And so there was a pretty good incentive to do it right the first time, or you would do it over. I've passed that little blessing right, or you'll get to do it again. <laughs> so there's a good lesson there that we learn from our employers. And, and early on, I'm sure you have your stories as well of uh, various impressions that were placed upon you by uh, the bosses that you worked for. Finally, consistently, our actions, even in the workplace, are to be informed by the teachings of Scripture. And, and that's true for every area of life. The, the Bible certainly should inform everything that we do. Uh, and God in His Word has given us enormous amounts of principles and wisdom that if we will wisely apply these principles, uh, we, we can live an honorable life, a life that gives evidence that Christ is in us and that uh, we are in union uh, with Him. So it's interesting in instruction here that Paul gives uh, to Timothy to share with this somewhat of an affinity group uh, in the congregation, this relationship between masters and, and slaves. And so the bottom line is, uh, if you're a master, you have a responsibility to be honorable and Christ-like, and if you are a bondservant, you have a responsibility to be Christ-like and hardworking and, and diligent uh, in your labors because this gives evidence of what you believe about Christ and the teachings of the gospel. Good text. Uh, let's pray together and then if you would, spend a few moments uh, in prayer at your tables. Thank you for coming out this morning. I very much appreciate it. Hope you have a great day.